Welcome to Turnpike Sports. I'm Dave Weishuttle, and as always, I'm joined by my producer and co-host, Doug Weishuttle. Doug, how are you on this fine NFL free agent friendly of a day? I'm I'm just it amazed a, at the... Uh, it is a frenzy. <laughs> yeah, it is a frenzy, but I'm just amazed at the amount of movement that was going on, not only at the start of free agency, but during the legal, tam- or the legal tampering period yeah, of the uh, NFL. I have not yet spoken to a Giant fan yet, but I'm sure they cannot be happy. But Landon Collins and Odell Beckham are gone. I think more people are upset about Landon Collins. Uh, I don't I Boy, this is... Yeah, I mean, first off, Landon Collins, they let him get to free agency. That was stupid. And uh, then... The Odell Beckham trade came out of nowhere, and how good are the Cleveland Browns going to be this year? I'm just astounded at the assembly assemblage of talent that they're getting together at Cleveland. It, and you know, I, I think the best thing that ever happened in Cleveland was John Dorsey taking over that team. Uh, he did a great job. Well, it, everything can go great or everything can go terribly wrong, so we're going to have to see. He's got the talent now. Let's see with uh, first-year head coach Kitchens does with it. Did Freddie Kitchens step in it? <sighs> wow, he got he got such an amazing team to to put on the field, both offense and defense. Defense was already pretty good last year. I mean, let, let me tell you something. I read something really insightful on Twitter. Uh, Freddie Kitchens is like the seventeen-year-old that just got a Ferrari. He's got a lot of gas in that engine, but you know what? It could he could make a big mess of it though. So uh should be interesting. It'll be interesting to see if uh, Odell Beckham and, uh, was it, Jarvis Landry can actually share the same field together. I don't think they've ever played together other yeah, they, than college. They, yeah, they were teammates in I'm college. Pro, they, were, they, were actually, pro they were actually roommates in college, so uh, it should be interesting. Well, so. Baker Mayfield now has pretty much all the weapons there. Uh, actually, Baker Mayfield, uh, on his Instagram, I think, he uh, put out a picture of Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham. Well, I guess they were there last year or something. I don't know where they took the picture. They were but, working uh, out together last year. Well, well, guess what? They're going to work, work out together, together every a lot day. more. Yeah. So. And then Bell going to the Jets. Oh, yeah. Le'Veon Bell. Hey, Jets. Uh, boy, it's uh, a very interesting uh, New York sports week. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's always nice to see both teams doing things in terms of football, Giants and Jets. But uh, again, you got to wait and see what the Giants are doing with this. Uh, see how it all shakes out. I mean, if this is Eli Manning's last year, they did not give him anything to throw to. Yeah, well, we're gonna talk all about what's happening in the world, and then stick around later on. I get to talk with Adam Small from USBets dot com. You know, it's always great talking about uh, talking to Adam because he has the lowdown of what's going on with casinos and sports betting all throughout the country. So we get a great update from Adam from USBets dot com. Yeah, no, uh, mo- some of the, some of the most uh, informative stuff I've heard from uh, pretty much anybody out there. He knows everything that's going on and. Quite honestly, the betting scene changes constantly. It, it's constant. It's really constant from day to day. I mean, this week there's more sports books opening. There's, and we'll talk there's about those. Stuff with online casinos come in. A lot of stuff with esports too. It's it's changing. The landscape is changing constantly. And like I said, it's been a busy week, so let's take a trip down the turnpike. And today's trip down the turnpike is brought to you by Drizzly, your online liquor store. Available in over 95 cities across North America, Drizzly offers a huge selection and competitive pricing with a side of personalized content. Now there's no need to leave the house. Get alcohol delivered in less than an hour by Drizzly. Head on over to drizzly.com and order today. And now get $5 off your first order of $20 or more when using promo code DRINK19 at checkout. Shop beer, wine, and liquor with drizzly.com. Exit 1. Well, like we just mentioned, the sports betting scene is constantly changing, and we've got a whole bunch of things uh, going on. Uh, let's start in Pennsylvania because we just had two uh, new sports books launch, uh, Valley Forge slash FanDuel. I guess it's uh, Boyd Gaming and FanDuel, really, mm-hmm. since uh, they Boyd bought Valley Forge. They launched their sports book, their and this physical, is, physical sports book. And this is F- uh, FanDuel's first sports book in uh, Pennsylvania, right? Yep. Okay. And uh, it's at the Valley Forge Casino. Uh, it's it's not a big one. It's uh, I I'm, mean, I'm, I'm very curious to see where it's at. In the casino. It's a, it, it, the casino is like one giant gaming floor, and I, I'm wondering where it's at in relation to that. It, is it off the floor? Is it in the middle of the floor? I haven't seen it yet, so it should be interesting. From what I understand, it's 
off to the side of the floor near where you go for those restaurants and everything okay, else. Okay, great. Yep. Yeah. It's 1,800 square feet, seven seven teller windows, six self-service terminals. See, this is it. 20, 20 staff members at the peak of its opening times. Seating capacity for 30 people. It's not a big one. I know, but... Considering what it is. It's just in time for March Madness. Yep. Well, that's what Good they timing. wanted to. And uh, not to uh, f- uh, be outdone, Parks has opened their third, uh, the Valley Forge Race and Sportsbook. And that used to be the Valley Forge Turf, Turf Club. Club. If yeah. anyone in that area is familiar with the Valley Forge Turf Club, it's now the, what? what is it? The Valley Forge Sp- Race and Race Sportsbook. Sportsbook. Yeah. So uh, both those have opened. Uh, Valley Forge actually had a uh, Philadelphia Eagle do the first bet. I know. Yeah. Brent uh, Selleck. Can't, yeah, it perf- perfect place for it too. I mean, Absolutely. Philadelphia, all that stuff. He threw out the uh, first bet. Threw out the made the first. Bet. <laughs> threw, threw out, out the, the first. Yeah. yeah. He, uh, what did he bet on? Anyone know? What he, he, he better bet on the Eagles. Uh, actually, I think he might have bet on the Phillies. Oh, okay. Well, that's good too. Which leads me into going into New Jersey. We have the probably the last property on the boardwalk opening up a sports book. This is going to probably be the last one on the boardwalk that's going to have a sports book. Tropicana. Yep, Tropicana. What is it? Uh, William Hill, right? Tropicana, William Hill. Um, Which, by the way, about a week ago, two weeks ago, we a shot week be- a week before we shot some pictures and did some movies of them still building it two weeks ago. Oh and yeah, it, it, they must have put it into overtime because I, I was surprised how quickly they opened up they after were, we shot those pictures. They were working around the clock, and um, this this is actually a really. It's supposed to be a really nice sports book. I, when we were down there filming it while I was under construction, it looked huge. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, it's a 5,000-square-foot interactive space is what they're calling it. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> when you get to talk to people talk, behind the, talk to <laughs> the, people, the tellers. Yeah, ba- basically, that, that's what they mean. <laughs> okay. Uh, they're going to have, hang on, let me get this, uh, a video display board that can show up to 16 games at one time, eight betting windows, including a high-limit window. Oh, okay. Yeah, 180 seats, bar and lounge style seating. There's also elevated VIP seating, which is being offered to players. And I went to their website and to uh, do some seating there. You can actually reserve space. That's you have it all set up. That's it, in the VIP. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, you can actually reserve space. I'm, I'm assuming even if the if, if it's not VIP, you can actually reserve seats like like you do an ocean resort. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can reserve any seat you want in there. You just call ahead. I got to tell you, it's a great location because it's not too far off the boardwalk. If you get off the boardwalk in the Chicky and Pete's entrance, Chicky and Pete oh, is right a uh, sports bar right there. It's a local chain in the Philadelphia area. Uh, it's right in the opening of the boardwalk there, and you go right next to it. So yeah, no, they they did a nice job. Even, even we saw how big it was going to be when they were building it. Still. The footage was just uh, really yeah, interesting uh, watching uh, it. Go to our Facebook page. You can uh, yeah. actually take a look at some of the, uh, I mean, <laughs> in the uh, pre-glitzier uh, days a couple weeks ago when they were still, uh, I think we still have the workmen actually oh, yeah. carrying stuff. Going right there. by the camera and yeah. everything. Yeah, so. Yeah, so, But, no, they got it all up and running and, of course, throwing out, the, I keep saying that, <laughs> making the first uh, ceremonial bet. Another was former Eagle. An owner of the Atlantic City Blackjacks. Yep. Ron, Ron Jaworski. Jaworski. Yep. He made the first bet, and he bet on the Phillies. Okay, good. He made a bet on the Phillies. So uh, he went straight down the line, Homer, all that stuff. So that that makes sense I mean, for him to do that. Yeah. So Because I remember somebody in, uh, what was it, when Rivers in Pittsburgh opened up their uh, sports book, somebody made a bet on another team, not the Steelers. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's nice to see them doing that. Uh, New Jersey's proposing new fines for prohibited sports bets in the state. Um, you can't, you know, according to the way that everything is set up, you can't bet on uh, any collegiate sport or athletic event which takes place within New Jersey's boundaries, and you can't bet on any event included that includes a New Jersey college team. I got to tell you, every, everyone was so happy uh, a couple days ago. Iona, which is a uh, New York college, beat Monmouth to get into the uh, March Madness. <laughs> so I think everyone in New Jersey was rooting for Iona because if Monmouth went in, people in New Jersey would be prohibited from betting that game. So I, I think it was it's a weird kind of situation where you can't bet on colleges in your own state. Well, there are a couple instances of taking some of these quote-unquote illegal bets 
at some of the sports books in Atlantic City. And this is what spurred on this uh, rule change or proposed rule change. And they just want to make sure that everybody uh, adheres to it. I believe the fine wasn't that big when they did it. It was like $2,000 or something. And now they want to do uh, fines between ten and 20000 as well as suspending uh, licenses. You know, it's weird. How can how can they take bets on I mean everything's computerized. If I go up and ask for a game, it's they're already in the computer. So how is a New Jersey college or university in the computer where they're betting? It's I don't know how that happens. It depends on the software. Oh okay. Well it's software driven. The software doesn't pick it up. You know, if it's a Should if, the casino be I, I guess they have to oversee everything. If it's, if, but it's a, if it's a national sports book operator inside the casino, their software may not pick up oh, the. Oh, okay. You know, they, they, wonder, got, they is, got to go through one software. Is that a platform. job for someone? Does the casino hire someone? Hey, look at the national numbers and uh, make sure New Jer- no New Jersey colleges are in their universities. It's interesting. I wonder if uh, they have a job like that. They got, they got to have that because that's yeah. part of the IT. Yeah, process, I, I just never knew how. A casino, which, you know, everything's on the big board, everything's on the computer. How could they even have a New Jersey college or university in their software? I just never never thought about that. No, it, it's just a matter of programming, I think. And then you got to do overseeing of it. So, uh, But we're getting proposed new rules. We'll see if they pass through. But, uh, again, it's, it's a matter of a heftier fine or a suspension of the license. And... Rounding out today's exit for sports betting, we have the second sports book opening in New Mexico. Uh, this is the Buffalo Thunder Casino in Santa Fe. They opened up their sports book six months after the Santa Ana Casino opened in October of 2018. That's over in Albuquerque. Mm-hmm. So New Mexico has its second sports books. They're offering race wagering as well as sports betting. You know, it's interesting about New Mexico is sports betting isn't even legal there. You know, these are Native American uh, uh, reservations. But they're things. doing it under their compact. Yeah, I know. But, I mean, statewide it's not legal, but on tribal land, tribal land it is legal. So Beca- it's Because it's, uh, uh, New Mexico has sports betting labeled in under class, I think it was class three or class two, whichever class it was, where the, the tribal gaming compacts fall under. So they don't have to do any kind of restructuring of the of the gaming compact they have with the state to open up sports bank cuz it already falls under their tribal compact. Yeah. But uh you know it's it'll be interesting and also it'll be interesting to see exactly what happens down in West Virginia with uh, uh the uh Delaware North property. So. <laughs> what, what a bad week they've had through no fault of their own by the way. I guess uh Every uh, sports betting was suspended for their properties because of a third party contract dispute. Uh, well, it's not even between them; it's between their provider, Miami. That's a third party. And Miami, well, I think Miami. Miami. Did I say it wrong? Miami. Miami. Miami, Miami and Miami. Miami. Yeah. Miami. Well, apparently, Miami had a contract dispute with some other person, which affected Delaware North's ability to right. take bets. So through no fault of their own, Delaware North was prevented from taking bets at what? Their two physical properties and their Bet Lucky app, and their only one app, but, in but West only Virginia. in West Virginia. We got to see what happens with Arkansas. Arkansas just announced they're opening a Bet Lucky sportsbook yeah. at a Delaware North property. Yeah. I don't know if Miami's going to be involved in that one or not. So yeah, I hope everything gets squared away because this is a big betting week for college basketball. The March Madness. They hopefully everything gets squared away. Everything gets settled, and uh, you know people can bet. Well, March Madness is probably a lot bigger down south than it is pretty much anywhere else. I mean, they're all college sports in West Virginia. Oh, sure, sure. Exit two. All right, we got a couple of things going on in the esports world. Uh, the the E League and Psionics, which is a video game development company, are hosting what's going to be called the Collegiate Rocket League tournament at the Final Four. Fan Fest in Minneapolis. Uh, oh, is it, it's like the Super Bowl where they have events around the actual yeah. games. Okay, yeah. So yeah. they're 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 doing that. They're doing the Rocket League. Um, basically, it's a it's it's a car race, uh, racing car, combined with a soccer game. I don't even. You're I basically playing even, soccer at racing cars. Really? Yeah. All you're right. scoring goals and everything else. It's it's a combination of those two. So you're watching cars hit a ball. Is that what you're saying? Or? Going racing around tracks and everything else, doing okay. maneuvers, 
jumping, all that other stuff. Uh, it's it's. I've seen clips of this game. It's actually pretty cool. They're rocket powered battle cars. Now, how do I mean? Are, can anyone play these things? No, this this, this is fest, this or? is professional. Oh, okay. These are yeah. This okay. is an actual tournament. And the the one thing I'm re- the reason I'm bringing this up is because TBS is going to be broadcasting a tournament recap show on TV. TBS, really? TBS. They're doing a a post game wrap up kind of thing. Yeah, or they're do, they're doing a recap show where there's going to be. Uh, Film filmed footage from the competition, both the players and the game itself. Wow! Uh, it's also the entire tournament's going to be broadcast on Twitch too. So uh, it's it's one of those things where you know I got to check this out. Moving on, on to broadcast TV. I'm, I'm very curious to see how they're going to film this. This is going to be a split screen where you see the actual footage and the then you have another set. Of or another screen and show the actual player and his expression well, I, while playing. I've or? seen the NBA 2K stuff okay. on Twitch, and they show both. They have they do split screen. They show the kids playing or the guys playing, and the game on screen. So they're probably going to do something similar like that. But also part of this is E League is going to be producing a little docu series reality show around it around the entire season seven for this Rocket League Championship series. Okay. So, and that's going to be uh, on TBS as well. Hmm. So uh, they're moving. They're moving into the uh, the broadcast TV realm with all this stuff. They're moving off Twitch and stuff like that. And they're going to uh, TBS. So little by little, they're starting to make the move to actually being like a real sports thing. And just not to be outdone, AT and T is now backing a new amateur mobile gaming tournament with ESL. ESL is the the competitive gaming company. They they do all this they do a lot of the uh t- tournaments for esports. They organize them. So these are amateur. The, this is not going to be uh they're they're not going to have the uh, last week we were talking about the um uniforms and the footwear when when we see amateur these are People off the street that are this is strictly these games. amateur. Anyone wants to play? Okay, that's they can pretty, do that's it. good. This is going to be a year round tournament that AT and T is doing. Um, they're going to have the ESL Mobile Open, uh, which is basically that's where everyone can go and you know start playing. Uh, that's going to be launching March eighteenth, and it's going to be a combination of the different games: Player Unknown Battleground, which is basically just a battle royal type simulator where everyone just goes in and fights each other. Okay. Uh, Clash of Ca- Clash of Clans, which I've seen on the commercials for on TV, which is basically you build your clan and you fight with warring clans, that sort of stuff, to make yourself, you know, it's like Risk. Huh, okay. And then Asphalt 9 Legends, which is just a straight racing game. So, and you know, there's a prize pool in the finals for a $330,000 prize pool. So money's getting bigger there. And uh, AT and T is going to be uh, one of the biggest uh, sponsors for all this stuff. I'm ass- I'm assuming since AT and T is involved, there's going to be a mobile element to it. I mean, it's I'm, all mobile. No, it, it's all mobile. I mean, it's all mobile. I mean, the, tablets and phones. Yeah, but when you're no doing console game. when you're doing a tournament, you hook you your, still bring your phone and your tablet. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, I thought you know. No, you no. sit down at a terminal that they already have. That's built the console. For you. That's the console. Okay, thing. That's, all right. That, that's different. This is so straight this is, mobile. This is mobile. Okay, this is mobile. See that's great. That that what makes it really amateur because you can bring your own stuff in. You can practice on what you're going to be playing. That's, I on. think at some point I they may stop great. that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's... you know, just to make sure because, well, this leads into the next part of this exit. Uh, Respawn Entertainment, which uh, they just launched this Apex Legends game. It's the competitor to Fortnite. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they gained 10 million uh, users in over a weekend from its launch. Uh, they now have just banned. As of March eighth, three hundred fifty-five thousand players on the PC platform alone for cheating. How do you cheat on a game that you know it's it? See, this is another thing. I, it, this is software. How do you cheat with software? I don't get. We, I mean, are you communicating with another person? There's and they that. say you do this and I do that. And there, there's that's what also happens, there's or? also different you know you know security patches people can exploit and all that stuff. So there's well, see, whole... I don't think that's cheating. I think that's being advantageous, and well, you know that's... the system, and you, you can uh, take advantage of it. Good it, for them, it, I think. In other words, it's cheating. Yeah. So... By, by the way, I, I saw a, a Legends 
channel. I, I always go on Roku to see what new channels there are, and I saw an Apex Legends that's, streaming channel. So that's, that's uh, part of all this stuff. Is but, it really? But I yeah, was like, uh, but again, you know, I didn't look at. it. I guess I, I should look at it. They, they, yeah. They've they've only banned three hundred fifty five thousand players. I'm sure coming see, more coming down the road. I think that's a but lot. They've got fifty million players playing the game already. Oh, okay. So it's a it's a very it's a very small number percentage wise, but it's a it's a big number enough. To, for have, having them worry about this stuff. And they're actually going to be issuing new rules for cheating that they're not disclosing yet. But I, see, I don't think that's cheating, though. Hey, if you know, in a, like in a casino, even gambling, if you if you know something that's happening, if a dealer or another player is holding their cards up too high and you see it, hey, so be it. That's part of the game. Uh, I don't think this you, is cheating. You mean like it, what happened in New Jersey just recently with the online casino advantage players? Where they, I don't think that's cheating either. They exploited I, a hole in the programming? Well, I don't think that's cheating. But they got their money. I don't think yeah. that's, that's not cheating. Exit three. All right. In this exit, we've got a whole bunch of different fan interactions, some good, some bad. What a tough week to be a fan of sports. <laughs> I guess just keep your mouth shut and sit there. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, this is telling you not to not to talk to players, not to touch, not to talk to an owner. Yeah, which is interesting in enough for itself. Right the guy's there. a jerk. Well, let, let's let's do let's do one first. This is this is actually the right way to handle an unruly fan because I don't think some of these other ones are unruly to a certain extent. In a soccer game between Aston Villa and Birmingham City, a guy a fan ran onto the field and punched one of the players. Yeah, you can't do that. that I'm assuming he was insanely drunk. At he the time. he was not drunk. He says no, he wasn't no, drunk. And he just the, stupid. He just ran out and he got carried away, according to everybody. And then he got carried away. Yeah, and then he <laughs> and literally he, got carried he away. Really got carried he, away. He uh, punched the guy. He punched uh, what's his name? Uh, bu- 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 the player named Grealish. He punched him in the side of the head, and then, uh, which is interesting because Grealish later scored the winning goal in the game. He was a, he was a fan of the other team. Oh, wow. And obviously it woke, it woke Grealish up enough to score the winning goal. They arrested him. He was sentenced to 14 weeks in jail. And uh, That's a lot. That's 14 a lot. weeks in jail for jumping onto the field and hitting someone? I think that's, uh, that's a lot. And this is after his defense attorney was saying he was being death threats. And his family was getting death threats for what he did. And he's now in jail for 14 weeks. Oh. I, don't, I don't know what's going on with his family, but... He's in jail. For I, a while. I, you know, let me tell you something. Soccer overseas is a religion, and you know, I guess if you interfere in any way p- with the game, or if anyone perceives you as helping the other team win, maybe that's what's happening. But the, the, you know, fan is short for fanatic, and that's what soccer fans are in Europe. Well, moving from worse to a little bit better, but still bad. Uh, Conor McGregor is in the news again for getting involved with the fan. Uh, a fan and him were walking out, leaving the Fountain Blue Miami Beach Hotel after a, a card, and uh, the fan tried to take a picture with him. So Conor McGregor, being the lovely guy that he is, took the phone, stomped on it, threw it on the ground a couple more times, picked it up, and walked away with it. Okay. And uh, the uh, fan decided to press charges. So let me tell you something. I mean, did the fan try and do a selfie? Is that? I mean, did he yeah. grab him at all? Did he? Touch I don't know. I, no, it's Conor very, McGregor it's very, it's at all? It's very unclear how First, he wanted to take the picture. What McGregor did was terrible, was stupid, was wrong, and he shouldn't have done it. But let me tell you something. If if you touch an athlete on why, that he doesn't want or something like that, see, I mean, he didn't come up and put his arm around him and try and do a selfie, did he? Or he might have done that because he tried to take a picture with. McGregor, when they say it that way, usually the guy's right up against you at yeah, least. Yeah, I mean, you know. But he, uh, they arrested McGregor and charged him with felony strong-armed robbery and criminal mischief. Hey, you know what? Some of those phones are pretty expensive. I just got a new phone, too. I'm shocked at the price of well, some of these things. So you know what? If you walk away with something like that, that's that's an expensive piece of equipment. The fan is claiming that his phone was worth $1,000. It could be. Hey, yeah. those things are crazy, man. Yep. I don't even have an Apple, and I spent a lot of money for it. Yeah, well, phones are getting more and more expensive. They're like little computers. I remember when they used to be free. Yeah, that's a long time ago. Uh, Going to the next level in our uh, scale of going from worse to good or funny, 
Uh, Russell Westbrook, Oklahoma City's uh, player, Again. Russell Westbrook, had another run in with the fans. Seems like another it's every one week. in another one in Utah. This is his second or third time in Utah with a Utah fan. Um, during the game, he was over by the sidelines and he heard, according to him, he heard one of the fans shout out, "Get on your knees like you're used to." I don't even know what that means, but I guess it's something derogatory or. He, he or he perceived it as something well, derogatory. What, <laughs> see, er, er, everything is still unclear as to what the fan actually said, but in his ears, it was something racial and inappropriate, especially with you know other kids there and everything else. So whatever he actually said set him off, and he went off on the fan and the fan's wife. Okay. Um, he had a few choice words for both. How do you, of how them. Do you know it was his wife, though? He said it. He said, the, he, he, F you up, F your wife no, up. No, but how did Westbrook know he was Don't married? ask me. That's Don't a, ask me. That's just an interesting, uh, it's pretty insightful. Uh, you know, he probably just assumed it. Yeah. So, but uh, there, There's got to be footage of what the fan said. I mean, there's security everywhere. The, the, what I saw was a uh, was a cell phone footage. I'm sure there's something from the fan or well, something according like to, that. According to the fan, he said, ice those knees up. Okay. I mean, I don't know how it gets translated I to get down are. on your knees like you're used to. They don't even sound alike to me. But at the time, you know, it's a he said, she said. Uh, Westbrook got a $25,000 fine out of this. And the fan eventually has gotten banned from the arena for any and all events, not well, just well, basketball. It's, it's, it, it, I, I read somewhere where they were issued warning cards. At the time, yeah. So he, I guess... He wasn't asked to leave at that time. Yeah, but apparently he was saying something. Yeah, somebody determined he said something. To, so it, to, was it security that determined? Security gives the cards. Out. I guess so. Okay. But, uh, yeah, again, at the time, you know, they could only go by what Westbrook was telling them. That's why they issued the cards. Uh, again, you know, it, it's it just doesn't sound right what the fan is interpreting what he said. He said it started off as fun. It got carried away, all that stuff. Who, the fan said that? Yeah, it's all Westbrook's fault. Westbrook overreacted. That's what caused it. But twenty five thousand to Westbrook fine wise, and the fan is now gone from the arena. I also heard the fan is suing him too. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you got to if you're going to claim that you didn't say anything wrong. Yeah. So, and then last but not least, we have James Dolan. What a jerk! What an absolute jerk! Watch, I'm going to get banned from Madison Square Garden now. Well, if we keep this up, maybe. <laughs> yeah, right. But, uh, again, it, it he was coming into the arena uh, for the game. And I think he was, was he going in or leaving, or what was he doing? He I was, don't know. Here, I got the little pattern of what happened here. He was leaving the courtside area late in the, the game, the Knicks versus the Kings on Saturday, and off camera you hear a fan yell, sell the team. Dolan stopped and responded, you think I should sell the team, and then – Tells the fan to come nearer. You you want to not come. You want to not come to any more games. I'm trying to read this exactly. Uh, why? Dolan said it was rude. Fans responded to an opinion. No, it's not. And you know what? Enjoy watching them on TV. And he had them escorted out of the the stands. That may be one of the worst ways to handle fan interaction because it I wasn't mean, really. It probably it probably was funny when the guy said it. Apparently, the next Nick home game is against the Lakers this weekend, so everyone at Madison Square Garden should chant, sell the team. That's my hope, and th that's, that's what should happen. Let's see, well, let's, what, let's see what Dolan does with that, because he's asking for it now. He made a situation—now er, the spotlight is on him now, and everyone's thinking, hey, you know what, he, maybe he should sell the team if he's this stupid. And look, the Knicks haven't had a winning season in, what, a decade? <laughs> My God. Well, sell the team. Do Dolan the fans is, are right. Sell the team. Now that I think about Do it. Dolan is just one of the worst owners out there. <laughs> oh, boy. Exit four. All right. We're going to end the turnpike ride going to high school. Now, High schools. Yeah. Huh? Now, the next game between Palo Alto and Los Gatos high schools, they're going to be missing something in the stands. And... It'll be the students. Really? Yep. According to the schools, they have all the students have been banned from games featuring Palo Alto and Los Gatos. So because both sets of fans can't get along right. with each other? Okay. Yeah, they have confrontations. They have, um, let's see, 
unruly behavior between the fans at football and basketball games. So for all athletic So contests, this is all sports. This is all sports. Okay. This is right. a, even baseball, everything these two teams play against each other in, they will not have any students in the stands. Wow, I've never heard of this. Well, it's it's not unusual because it's been done before. Well, if it's not for the students, who goes to these games? Family members. Uh, just family members? That's, you just want family members? That's, all that's, okay. all that's going to be there. All right. Okay. Uh, they had a uh, – see, what started all this, uh, the uh, Los Gatos fans, when, Palo, when a Palo Alto player was at a foul line taking a foul shot, somebody threw something on the field, on, on, the, on the court. At the at the uh, foul, foul free that's throw what shooter. started it all. Yep, and then after that game, seems kind of anemic. That well, then after that someone. game, all the student body seemed to have a uh, dust up in the parking lot. There seemed to be a fight between. Well, students. look, if it's for safety reasons, I guess they had to do it. Well, hey, they're going to do it for the entire year. There will be no students in the stands for Palo Alto and Los Gatos when they play each other. And like I said, this is this is not the only time this has happened. Uh, North Carolina in a couple of their high schools. Uh, students were not allowed to attend a playoff football game after a fight between players broke out, and the coaches argued. Huh. So that happened in North Carolina. Then in Boston in 2016, there was a, a ban on all the students from a championship basketball game after some of the students started shouting anti-Semitic remarks. Well, I guess it's uh, not unprecedented. I guess it's for safety reasons. So I guess it's sad they have to do it, but I guess they have to do it. Yeah, but it'll be interesting to see a high school game without students in the uh, stands. Yeah, so right. it'll be unusual. But uh, I guess uh, they'll you can have your pick of seats at this game, these yeah, games. Right. So you know, because no one's going to be in the stands other than family. Well, today's trip down the turnpike was brought to you by Drizzly, your online liquor store. Available in over 95 cities across North America, Drizzly offers a huge selection and competitive pricing with a side of personalized content. Now there's no need to leave the house. Get alcohol delivered in less than an hour by Drizzly. Head on over to drizzly.com and order today. And now get $5 off your first order of $20 or more when using promo code DRINK19 at checkout. Shop beer, wine, and liquor with drizzly.com. And as always, you get in touch with Turnpike Sports. You can call or text us at 609-512-5910. That's 609-512-5910. Call or text line at Turnpike Sports on Facebook and Twitter. Info at TurnpikeSportsRadio.com is our email address. Don't forget to email the International Bikini Team for your 2019 International Bikini Team calendar. That's info at internationalbikiniteam.org. You can also catch the show on your smart TVs, Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, at Binge Networks. Uh, also, uh, the show is carried by iTunes, iHeartMedia, uh, Stitcher Radio, and you can also catch the show on YouTube. Uh, so uh, uh, check us out on any of those outlets and uh, you know, give us an email or a text or let us know what you think of what's going on. And stick around, because after this, I get to talk with Adam Small from usbets.com. We're going to be talking about casinos, online gambling, sports betting, and everything that's going on around the country in the gaming business. So stick around. We'll be right back with more Turnpike Sports. Hey, this is Dave Weishadol from Turnpike Sports with this week's Bet Flash. The FanDuel Sportsbook at the Valley Forge Casino opened on Wednesday, March 13th at noon. The book, which is located in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, will occupy 1,800 square feet of space in the casino. This is the Keystone State's seventh sportsbook. And speaking of new sportsbooks, New Mexico has opened up its second book. On Monday, wagers were being accepted at the Hilton Buffalo Thunder Resort and Casino in Santa Fe. It joins the Santa Ana Star Casino and Hotel in Albuquerque, which opened its book almost six months ago. And finally, Atlantic City will have a new team to bet on. Starting this spring, the Atlantic City Blackjacks will be part of the Arena Football League and will play all their home games at Boardwalk Hall. The Ocean Resort Casino has been named the official casino sponsor for the team. Can't wait to check out a game. From the seaside to the desert, from the betting lines to the sites online, Turnpike Sports has got you covered. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at Turnpike Sports. 
Bright Tech offers unique no-dust lighting products that fit right into your home, no construction required. Elevated designs should be available to everyone, not just the folks with the big bank accounts. Trick out your living room, create your perfect reading nook. Whatever the situation, Bright Tech has a lighting solution for you. And now get 5% off of your entire order when using our promo code RADIO5OFF at checkout. Head on over to brighttechshop.com and start designing the life you want. Bright Tech, your bright life realized. You've been hearing me talk about my pillow and the benefits of using it to get a good night's sleep, alleviate your sore neck and back, and the special deal you can get for my pillow through the show. Well, not only can you pick up the special deal for four my pillows when you use promo code CARDS, but now you can get a hundred dollars off your purchase of the my pillow mattress. Yeah, that's right, the my pillow mattress. The my pillow mattress comes with a ten year warranty and a one hundred and twenty day money back guarantee. The my pillow mattress is made up of three unique layers, providing you the comfort and support to fall asleep and stay asleep all night. It even has the luxurious Dream Soft cover, which is stain resistant and stays cool all night. Just head on over to MyPillow.com, click on the MyPillow mattress link, and enter promo code CARDS at checkout to get $100 off your order. Or call 1-800-319-7913 to order by phone. That's MyPillow.com, or call 1-800-319-7913 and use promo code CARDS. Better sleep starts with MyPillow. Free stuff is awesome, but free stuff that will spice up your bedroom is even better. Just go to adamandeve.com and select almost any one item for 50% off, and then we'll load on the free stuff. Just enter this very exclusive code, BABE16, at checkout, and you'll get 10 tantalizing free gifts, including a sexy item for him, a special toy for her, and a third item you'll both enjoy. Ooh. And six extra special bonus items that are sure to rev your engine, pique your curiosity, Mm. and even blow you away. Plus, free shipping. Always sent in discreet packaging. Go to adamandeve.com now. Get 50% off plus the 10 free gifts when you enter the exclusive offer code BABE16. That's BABE16 because without it, no No free free stuff. stuff. That's BABE16 at adamandeve.com. We'll get right back to the show, but I want to take a minute to talk to you about being genius. How would you like your coffee delivered right to your door every month, maybe two times a month? Well, now that can happen with Bean Genius. Bean Genius sells freshly roasted coffee from some of the best independent coffee roasters in the country at BeanGenius.com. And Bean Genius actually learns their customers' individual taste preferences, then suggests future coffee blends for them. Well, how do they do that? Well, this is the cool thing about Bean Genius. Over at BeanGenius.com, they use an algorithm which learns the coffee flavors you like and then pairs up what you like with the coffee that they have in stock. And it's all based upon you. Every time you order, the system learns. The system learns your preferences as you go along and order more and more coffee. And now, all our listeners at Turnpike Sports can get a special offer. You head on over to BeanGenius.com slash subscription, and you'll be able to get 10% off your purchase when you use our promo code PIKE, P-I-K-E, at checkout. That's 10% off at BeanGenius.com slash subscription with promo code PIKE, P-I-K-E. BeanGenius.com, the smart specialty coffee subscription service. I bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. No way. I'll give you 3 to 1 odds. Nope. 5 to 1. Nope. 10 to 1. You're on. Welcome back to Turnpike Sports. You know, when it comes to gambling in this country, a number of states are making moves with regard to gambling expansion, sports betting, and legislation. Some sports books operators are even making deals that could change the face of the sports betting business. And as always, to keep us up to date about what's going on in the betting world, we have Adam Small from usbets.com. Adam, thanks for joining us. Great to be back, as always. Always happy to be on this show. Uh, it's great to have you. But before we get into the legislations of the states and what's going on in the country and the news, U.S. Bets is affiliated with NJOnlineGambling.com, and it, they just broke a major story about online gambling and online casinos in New Jersey. For people who haven't looked at it yet, can you tell us what that big story was? Yes, thanks. Uh, so uh, Eric Raskin 
spent a few weeks researching this before we were able to get the story out. It's uh, it's a long form story, longer than a lot of the content we usually put out day to day, and uh, it goes into detail about how some advantage gamblers, uh, people who who try to win at casino games, basically. Uh, found an edge in a game called Ocean Magic that they were playing in casinos in Las Vegas. And it's a game that's all over the world. Uh, it's a slot machine. And they figured out that right when you start the game, that the uh, wild bubbles that exist that kind of are kind of like a bonus round in the slot game were in a position that puts the player at, a, at an advantage for the first few spins. And they figured out that they could do that at every denomination. Like if they move from $1 to $2, the game starts over again, and they were able to take advantage of this uh, this advantageous situation for players, again, for the first four spins. And uh, they discovered uh, after a bit that this game was actually online at online casinos in New Jersey. And all of them flew to New Jersey. There were about 10 players, and... Uh, signed up accounts on all the different online casinos in New Jersey that had this game and just tried to take it for as much as they could before getting discovered. It took them about a week before the game came down everywhere in New Jersey. (laughs) But in the meantime, this group of players collectively had won about $900,000 playing this game. Just from spinning a few times, they were able to spin for uh, denominations as high as $3,000 to spin. And in some cases, we're winning as much as a couple hundred thousand dollars from a single online casino. And uh, and so uh, these guys made a killing over a period of a few days. And then when it came time to get their payouts, uh, some of the casinos didn't give them a problem. And a couple of them have just held up the process. They've mostly been paid by now at the time of this recording, possibly by the time... Uh, your listeners are listening, they'll have all already been paid because we believe that that is ultimately what's going to happen. But there are a couple of uh, online casinos that are actually saying they're just not going to pay them. And uh, well, really, just Borgata is the main one that is just basically saying, we're not going to give you this money because you violated our terms of service. And the players in response are saying, you know, explain to me how. And they won't explain because these players literally just went on and played a game that was there on the site. They discovered that they could win at that game, played it, won, and, uh, and you know, should get their winnings. They're owed uh, more than $100,000 by Borgata, as far as I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious of the legal basis of why the casinos would withheld uh, their winnings. I mean, are, are they gave no explanation. I know, I know on the gaming floor, there's always the excuse, well, there was something wrong with the game, so that would void a jackpot. But for online casinos, I can't see that would be the problem. Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there is a legal basis. I don't think that there is any legal basis for withholding their winnings. I think that the online casinos are are upset that, you know, they didn't catch this before putting this game live on their sites and uh, and are reviewing the situation and possibly the DG is reviewing it as well. And, uh, and, you know, I think what's ultimately going to happen is that everyone, including Borgata, is going to be forced to pay because you can't just decide that, because you put a game up and somebody won money at it that you're not going to pay out. And so I think that that is where that's where things are headed in the end. You know, it, it was an amazing story by Eric Raskin. He, he did a great job. Uh, where does this go from here? Are, are there rules and regulations that people are thinking about in the future to prevent this? Or it's something that happens and, you know, that's the disadvantage of being an online casino in this country? I mean, I think that, you know, being, I mean, a disadvantage of being an online casino, what you mean by that is just that they're forced to pay out, um, you know, when they have a flawed game. Yes, I mean, you know, if players are going in and losing money in that game, the casinos aren't giving it back. So, um, you know, they they don't really have a legal option in a regulated environment to just decide that because someone won that they're not going to pay out, then they're just, you know, giving themselves a 100% chance to win, which 
pretty pretty well violates the uh, you know the, the the trust the trust uh, between the consumer and the casino. And why would anyone play? Why would anyone gamble if they weren't going to get paid for winning? So um, you know there there wasn't any there's not anything laid out that suggests that players can't play only four spins at a slot or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So I mean I think that you know at the end of the day. Yeah, maybe an offshore casino would just say, you know, screw you, I'm not going to pay you, and I don't care, I don't want you as a customer anyway. But, um, you know, when it's, a, when it's a regulated environment, there has to be a procedure, and it's got to be uniform for all customers. And unless there's some way to prove that these people were somehow manipulating the game, like changing the game in some way that made it favorable to them, then I don't, I don't see how, how the casinos could have a, a case in these kind of situations. I mean, uh, you know, it's a little different when you talk about even the Phil Ivey case, which, you know, uh, interestingly enough involves Borgata too, of course. Sure. Um, you know, Ivey was changing the game somewhat. He was requesting certain things to be changed, which the, which the casino did agree to. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, it, it did sort of alter like what the rules and what the situation was in the game uh, in his favor um, and sort of against the spirit of, um, you know, what the casino was trying to offer. I mean, it's a really interesting case and it's been quite a saga and a lot of people disagree on, you know, who's wrong and who's right there, but it is a little different at least. Whereas in this case, these guys did not do anything to manipulate the game. They no, absolutely not. simply played it as it was and realized that if they played a certain number of trials without playing it for a long time, that they were ahead and, uh, and made money doing so. Yeah, It's absolutely an amazing story. Uh, NJOnlineGambling.com, it's up there now, and I guess USBets.com will have it soon on its site. Yeah, we'll be putting up a link on US Bets because a lot of people show up there for our, for our content in general, and we want to make sure they can find the article if they're not familiar with NJ Online Gambling. I suggest everyone read it because I, I think it will have ramifications in New Jersey. Um, but, you know, I, I want to turn our focus on some other states other than New Jersey, and I, I'm sure I'm sure the other states are looking at New Jersey to see how they handle this problem. But I, I want to get your picture of what's going on in the entire country, and I want to start with your home state of West Virginia. You know, a few months ago you told me, keep an eye on West Virginia – and they have done some amazing things in 2018, whether it be opening up a sports book or going live with their sports betting app. Right now, what's going on with West Virginia, and what can we expect from 2019? Well, what's going on in West Virginia so far is that they were uh, an early adopter of, of brick-and-mortar sports betting last year, passing a law before PASPA even fell. Um, big thanks to... Uh, the, 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 at the time, Lottery General Counsel there, Danielle Floyd, who really uh, took a leading role and did a, did a fantastic job shepherding that through. Um, and she's moved on now is, is with William Hill. But, uh, yeah, they, they got a law passed. They got brick-and-mortar sports betting launched fairly quickly after uh, PASPA came down at the Supreme Court. And, um, and they've, they've had reasonable but not overwhelming success running brick-and-mortar Sports betting. West Virginia, of course, is a small state. It's also a poor state, and uh, it's got only a few casinos spread out in various areas. Uh, but that being said, um, you know, things are, it's a moderate success, and online is kind of in the process of starting to happen there. Uh, no one's quite sure exactly how that's going to play out over time, but online sports betting is happening. And now, uh, in the state legislature, they're, they seem to be moving ahead with online poker and casino. Uh, this is not a done deal yet. Nothing has passed the legislature and gotten signed into law by the governor. But it seems like there's not a lot of opposition. And I think that West Virginia is one of the states that would fall into the, uh, the small bucket of states that are likely to pass uh, more comprehensive eye gaming, not just sports betting this year. You know, you're talking about the other states that might be going into iGaming. I just read on usbets.com about a state that I really wasn't thinking about. And when we're talking about online poker, that's Kentucky. What is the status right now with regard to the proposed legislation in Kentucky? Do they have the votes? Is it going to come up for a vote? What's going on in Kentucky? 
Yeah, it sure looks like it's going to happen um, in Kentucky for sure. I mean, it, it, it looks like one of the states that's very likely uh, moving forward with that. Uh, they've got a law on or a, a bill going through the process that uh, is for both online poker and sports betting. It does not include online casino gaming. And uh, <clears throat> right now, I, I believe the, uh, as far as I can recall in my mind, I believe the law the, the bill has in-person registration, which we hope goes away because it's so much, it's just so much better for online if you can register from home, you don't have to physically go in a casino to do that. I know there are certain interests that prefer in-person because it, it keeps the competition away, but uh, we, we certainly, uh, our, our perspective on it is that we prefer online registration and we've seen that work much better in New Jersey whereas in-person registration in, in Nevada has kind of really held back the growth of sports betting there. So, um, yeah, Kentucky Kentucky seems to be moving forward, at least with poker and sports betting, and I, I think that that's something that's going to happen. I think it's a state that's going to move ahead. And I'd like to just toot my own horn for a second here. I was saying in, uh, in interviews way back in 2013 – uh, with a couple of publications, they were asking what are going to be the next states to have online poker. And I know it's been six years now and a lot's changed, but I always, uh, I always said Kentucky was a dark horse to be one of the early adopters there because uh, Churchill Downs was always really interested in that business sure. and had made an investment in buying Bluff Magazine, which is now um, not as much as it was back then, but still something that Churchill Downs has spent money in, put some chips on the table, and uh, and they want to they want to play in that market, and they've got a lot of power in Kentucky. So I think they're definitely behind a lot of the progress there. Uh, you know, we're talking about online poker and some of the legislation. Has you know the change in the Department of Justice feeling toward online games have that has that kind of you know affected the legislation that's being proposed or are they just moving forward just as it never happened the DOJ's change in opinion you, you mean the, the wire act yeah the wire came act. Out. Yeah. Right. yeah I mean it's hard to say it's hard to say what the intangible effects of a thing are um, certainly I, I would assume there are at least some people out there who see the wire act opinion as uh, something that would give them pause about passing legislation to legalize online gaming in a new state. And I think, you know, a couple of years from now, if nothing has changed uh, in terms of that Wire Act opinion or, you know, there are a number of lawsuits surrounding that now, but if nothing's changed with any of that in a couple of years, I think we'll be able to look back and have a clearer picture of how that opinion affected progress. Uh, but that being said, it does not seem like the states are holding back right now. It seems like states are thinking that they can still legalize online casinos and online poker and online sports betting. And, uh, and even with poker, in the case of West Virginia, the, uh, the, the law that seems to be moving through explicitly allows interstate online poker. So um, it doesn't seem to me like people are very scared right now of that opinion and uh you know it's it remains to be seen if there will be any actual legal repercussions if there will be any uh action by the doj to try to enforce this i'm i'm pretty skeptical of it personally just because uh the wire act has such a a flimsy history of, of holding up in court against anything other than mob related <laughs> interstate <laughs> Sports betting activity. So, um, and by flimsy, I mean it really has no no history of succeeding uh, with anything uh, in regards to poker or other games. So, um, in spite of the opinion, it seems like seems like the industry and legislatures are moving forward. And there's actually been just an incredible amount of activity on that front, uh, particularly for sports betting in the last few weeks. You know, another state I'm interested in is Illinois. I know whenever you have a state with a metropolis in it, like Chicago, I would expect the gambling revenue to be pretty large. I, and I know the governor stated that he hopes to see about $200 million in licensing fees from legalized sports betting. Where is Illinois in their gambling expansion efforts? Illinois always seems to be close. Yeah. But um, I say that with the caveat that that is not a new thing. 
that's not a post paspa thing. It's just um, the way it's been for a while. It was almost two years ago now, right around the end of May 2017, when uh, an iGaming uh, bill actually passed one of the houses of the Illinois legislature. I can't remember if it was the, the uh, House or the Senate, but it passed uh, one of the two houses, and it happened kind of out of the blue and seemed like all of a sudden this is something that's going to happen. And uh, and then they never got to the finish line on it. But um, it's been something that Illinois has been considering for a long time. The state has really serious budget issues, kind of like Pennsylvania's situation a couple of years ago before they passed their gambling expansion. And Illinois, I think, is looking at that model and seeing an opportunity to plug some of that budget gap. Um, on the other hand, there are major issues with corruption in that state and uh, including surrounding video gaming terminals, which uh, in case people aren't familiar with them, they're basically, it's kind of like gambling in bars where you have these machines that you can play certain kind of slot-like games on or slots or roulette or whatever, and, uh, and you're gambling for real money. And uh, Illinois did a massive expansion of video gaming terminals a few years back and it has not gone very well. Unfortunately, it just seems like the the law was written in such a way that it allowed uh, it allowed for a very lightly or almost unregulated environment for this stuff. Um, the, the terminals have ended up mostly in poor areas, kind of rural areas of the state, and a lot of there have been a lot of problem gambling issues and other problems that have been caused by these things. And there's a sour taste about it. ProPublica uh, did a major research uh, project on this very topic just a couple months ago, and the, the paper that they put out was pretty, pretty damning for the industry. And so Illinois now, people have to understand that that's the backdrop of this situation. That's the uh, that's on the mind of legislators and also of the general public in Illinois. That they just did this disastrous major gambling expansion that was very poorly thought through a few years ago, and the consequences of which have been negative and haven't even really borne out all the way yet. And so I think it's a little more challenging in that particular state. It's also a big, complex state with a big population and many interests. And it seems like in, in many cases, the bigger the state, the more problems there are getting consensus. Um, so we've seen California's example, example one of this, right, and their inability to pass online poker for the last 10 years. So um, Illinois, I'm not holding my breath, but okay. we sure hope it happens. Well, speaking of a state that has a large city in it and a large population, uh, Massachusetts is eyeing some gambling expansion legislation. I know Boston is going to open up a new casino this summer, and Governor Charlie Baker put forth his own proposal on legalizing sports betting. Uh, where is Massachusetts right now with regard to legislation? And regarding sports betting, how likely are they to have it in 2019? Yeah, good question. Massachusetts is a really interesting one. Uh, of course, it's where DraftKings is sure. based, which is now one of the leading uh, sports book providers in the United States. That's happened really quickly. And uh, Boston is also the site of uh, ICE North America, the conference in May that's going to be one of the biggest gambling conferences in the U.S. now. Mm -hmm. uh, there definitely seems to be a movement towards Boston and towards Massachusetts for uh, a lot of uh, industry people and industry interests. They've always had that Sloan conference about sports at MIT, but it seems like more and more is gravitating that way. And so, um, you know, Boston could become a hub of the U.S. gambling industry, and if so, it makes a lot of sense that the state would also be on the forefront of regulation and legalization of, of uh, you know, games that are appearing elsewhere in states like New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, that being said, Massachusetts has not come down firmly with uh, a single bill that seems to be moving forward. Mm -hmm. There are, at last count that I had, I think five different bills that have been introduced in the state. Uh, there are a number of different options that are on the table, and there doesn't seem to be consensus yet. So it's hard to say exactly when things are going to happen there, when it's going to move forward, because 
people haven't agreed on what it is that's going to move forward. But I do think that most of the stakeholders seem to agree that something should move forward. And that bodes fairly well for sports betting to pass in the near future in the state. Whether it's going to be online in 2019 or available in a retail setting in 2019, I think that very much um, depends on how soon they're able to get a consensus. Because if it's you know May or June, and I'm not sure exactly what the legislative calendar is like in Massachusetts, but if you know if we get towards mid year for passing a law, it seems to me less likely that they'd be able to have things ready in time for football season. Just takes a little longer than that. So um, yeah, I think it just very much depends on how quickly they reach consensus on what the bill is that is actually the bill that's going to advance. Does the fact that Rhode Island has legalized sports betting put pressure on Massachusetts to move forward with this? Because I know one of the places where you can place a bet in Rhode Island is only about 45 minutes away from Boston. So you would think that would light a fire under them to get something going. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes that stuff is more more psychological for the you know industry than, than it is anything that legislatures actually care about. Um, it's a good talking point for, for people like us, for sure, that, you know, why, why would you want it to be illegal when people are going to cross your border? We certainly say this about New York all the time, right? Sure. That's the kind of the, the exhibit A of all that. But, um, you know, that being said, I mean, every state just has its own issues and its own things to work through. And I think that what I keep coming back to when I talk about topics like this is, it's not so much that Massachusetts is trying to decide whether or not to legalize sports betting. Like maybe that's what they're saying, but I think that I, I don't think anyone, I don't think there's a significant faction that doesn't want to legalize it. I think that it's, it's more a matter of we're not going to move forward as lawmakers until it's clear to us that everybody agrees on what it is that should move forward. And that's the, that's the complexity at this point. It's not, um, you know, do we need sports betting or should it be legal? It's, it's um, you know, who, how's the licensing going to work? Who's going to be involved in that? What's it going to cost? What are the tax rates going to be? Uh, which ent- entities are going to be involved and how? And, you know, are outside participants going to be allowed in and so on and so forth. So I think, um, you know, until all that kind of stuff gets resolved, it won't move forward regardless of, what Connecticut and Rhode Island and New Hampshire and everyone else do. You know, everyone's been waiting a long time for Pennsylvania to start online casinos. What's going on with Pennsylvania? So what's happened in Pennsylvania is that uh, the, the launch date keeps getting pushed back. And everything that I've everything that I've heard when I talk to people who are reasonably in the know there is that they want to have kind of what I would call a gunshot launch, kind of like a swim meet when they, you know, fire the gun and everyone dives in at the same time. Um, they, uh, they want to let all the online casinos and online poker sites and online sports books have a chance to launch on the same date. And, uh, you know, everyone who's ready, at least by that date, that is kind of preset and that everyone knows about going in. And that's, that's what New Jersey did as well. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, and when I was hearing about this in, you know, maybe November, December, it sounded like we're, we're talking about something in maybe mid spring, April, May kind of time frame. But, uh, that was before the wire act opinion and the Pennsylvania gaming control board has come out and said that they want to proceed with caution and that operators need to comply with the wire act as, as is now currently interpreted by the DOJ and uh, and that they were waiting to see what regulations uh, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein comes out with, which we're expecting in the near future. And uh, and so I think things are a little bit up in the air with that right now. There's definitely at least the appearance that there's going to be some delay from when people were expecting it, which is kind of you know disheartening because we've all been waiting so long already. It was around Halloween 2017 when that law passed, and we still don't have online gaming in Pennsylvania. We're looking at uh, about a year and a half in now almost. So, um, yeah, it's a little disappointing that things haven't moved faster there. But uh, every indication is that it's still coming, you know, before mid-year this year. 
You know, I kind of want to switch our attention to the corporate world and talk about the huge deal between Caesars and DraftKings. I mean, this one seemed to come out of the blue for me. What is the deal and what does it mean for both parties? Yeah, um, well, the the background is that uh, Caesars purchased some equity in DraftKings and um, Caesars is I think that both parties are gonna are gonna see some gains as a result of this. Um, exactly what those gains are, I think, remains to be seen because I, I think a lot of us are making assumptions that uh, may or may not be true about what this deal means. Um, for example, uh, I think everyone's been waiting a while to find out where DraftKings is going to land in Pennsylvania mm-hmm. in terms of um, who will be their licensing partner in Pennsylvania. And uh, FanDuel is already clearly coming in with Valley Forge, but DraftKings uh, had not announced a partner and still really hasn't. And I think a lot of people assumed right off the bat that, oh, well, DraftKings is coming in with Caesars. Myself included, that was the first thing I thought was, sure. oh, DraftKings will, will be a partner with uh, Harris Philadelphia, uh, which is owned by Caesars. But uh, the, the sports betting regulations in Pennsylvania actually only allow one skin per licensee. So they wouldn't be able to run a Harris or Caesars online online sportsbook and DraftKings. They can't do that. So um, it's still not clear to me that that DraftKings would be the only sports game sports betting brand through Caesars. It seems actually kind of unlikely, and um, they might still be in partnership with Penn National or or with one of the other uh, one of the other casinos, even though they're partly owned by Caesars, which. You know, to me, it just adds a little bit more complexity and confusion to the entire situation because DraftKings works with resorts in New Jersey sure, sure. and could potentially work with yet another company in Pennsylvania while being partially owned by Caesars. So um, I, I think there's a lot that still needs to play out here, but what's clear is that Caesars and DraftKings are going to be tighter than they were and, uh, and that you're, they're looking to capitalize on each other's assets at some point. You know, you you raise a you raise a great point. Uh, w- one of the things I read about the deal was someone brought up the fact that you know these online providers have to have a brick and mortar partner to be licensed in the state if you're using the New Jersey model. And someone thought that was a huge advantage. And sure, it's an advantage, but I'm not sure how big of an advantage it is yet. I mean, is that that big of an advantage to have already a partner who's licensed in the state? if you want to be online component of it? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's very hard to tell. Sure. I mean, uh, I think, you know, see, people people underestimate maybe how much infrastructure Caesars has already built out on their side. I mean, they have an online sports book in New Jersey, too. It's not as big as DraftKings yet, but um, they certainly put some, some effort and some, uh, and some capital into that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's really hard to say, but um, it's very clear that DraftKings is aggressively pursuing their position in the U.S. sports betting market, both online and retail, uh, more aggressively than Caesars has to date. And I guess one possibility in all this is just that, that Caesars lets them run with it, that DraftKings becomes the one that's that's um, you know trying to trying to be the main brand for them. But I just I kind of doubt that that's the way it ends up because um, it's not like Caesars owns DraftKings out right now. They've just they've got some equity and a partnership of sorts, and and so it's, it's really hard to uh, it's hard to suggest that Caesars would just back down from their own position in that market. You know, another partnership deal that recently occurred was between Top Golf and PointsBet. I, I think it's a good move by both parties. Can you give us an idea what this deal entails for both parties? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know it's pretty. It's kind of like stuff that we've been hearing about Buffalo Wild Wings sure. for a while. That buff- what's that? Yeah, no, sure. I, that's the thing I thought of. Oh, it's like the Buffalo Wild Wings kind of, kind of. I, I guess they didn't make a deal yet, but I, I know they want to get into something like this. Yeah, they've been Buffalo Wild Wings has been very open about their desire to have sports betting available in their restaurants, at least in states where sports betting is legal. And uh, you know, whether it's as a skin or as an affiliate or you know as a marketing partner or whatever, but some sort of situation where you're actually able to make bets at your table in Buffalo Wild Wings, which is really interesting. And I'm sure it's not the last we'll be hearing about it, and, and not the last company we'll be hearing about doing that. But it sounds like 
sounds like Top Golf is very much moving in the same direction. Um, I think you know mostly I would call them a marketing partner, um, but uh, the idea behind it is that when you visit Top Golf in uh, New Jersey and potentially other states in the future, that there will be places within the facility where you can uh, where you can make bets. I don't think they're going to have a retail sports betting counter or anything like that, but uh, they will have they will have uh, places that are sort of dedicated to like a lounge or something along those lines. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I think it's exciting news, uh, largely because, uh, top golf is just so popular among a very specific, uh, target demographic for sports betting. And, uh, I think it would be a very sought after partnership and, and it's impressive that points bet has come in and, and pick something up like that. And, uh, I'm actually, I just continue to be so impressed with points bet and their ability to get themselves into the news since, uh, since launching in this market. And this is an Australian company. They had no footprint in the U S really whatsoever. And now they're, they're very relevant all of a sudden in New Jersey. You know, it was interesting that uh, the news stories coming out in New Jersey was that, no, you can't place a bet at Top Golf, but, you know, points bet will be present. You know, I, I always made the joke in New Jersey, every sports bar is a sports book because, look, you, you have the game on and everyone's looking at their phones and looking at their tablets and you know that's what they're doing. So this kind of partnership made total sense. So do you really see this? paving the way of other partnerships between sports betting operators and non-gaming businesses? Definitely. I mean, I think that's, that's 100% going to happen. And, um, and I think it's going to happen because it just makes obvious sense. Like, like what you're saying that, you know, that people are sitting there looking at their phones, looking at how their bets are doing, um, making bets probably on offshore sports books. And it just makes sense that, uh, companies like Top Golf, like Buffalo Wild Wings, and like probably many other types of places that people go to watch sports are going to be looking for ways to add revenue by more tightly integrating the sports betting experience into the going to this sports bar or restaurant experience. Or in the case of Top Golf, I mean, I, I just think it's such a it's such a great synergy there because people go and spend a lot more time there, right, than they would at Chili's or, or B-dubs or whatever, I mean, they're going to top golf for this several hour potentially experience, hitting golf balls, eating food, watching games. And um, it just, it just seems like a very likely place for people to watch entire games or spend entire football Sundays or, or football Saturdays. And, um, you know, they could get a lot of bets placed by customers while they're in there. Adam, we're running out of time, but as always, I'm a lot smarter because I talk to you about things. So, and I just want to remind—I just want to remind everyone to keep up to date on everything that's going on in the gambling world by going to usbets.com. It is the number one resource for gambling, casinos, and sports betting news anywhere. Believe me, I can't do my job effectively if I don't read usbets.com every day. Adam Small from usbets.com. As always, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Dave, and thanks for all the kind words. Great oh, to be absolutely. back on. All right. Hey, have a great sports weekend, and uh, we'll see you next time on the Turnpike.